see you. Um, just a couple of um, announcements uh, for um, this week. Um, despite it being a bank holiday tomorrow, um, we will still have the prayer meeting um, at 7.30 if anyone's able uh, to come and join us um, for prayer. Okay, obviously next week, um, I should also say that next Sunday, we are still in the church building and then the following week we then refer and um, go back to the school so just everyone's clear that next Sunday um, we are here. So as we come to worship this morning some very familiar words from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 starting to read at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have and they had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And we thank you that we can have a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand for our first song, Christ our hope in life and death. <laughs>
And Father, we ask that everything that we say, we sing, um, as Ollie preaches from your word, that your name will be glorified and we will be encouraged in our walk with you. Amen. 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 Let's continue in our, um, our worship. And in that passage I read, sometimes there are um, trials, but for everything that we go through, um, we have Jesus for the joys and for the sorrows, for the best and worst of times. <coughs> Everything. And we thank you for being 
uh, repeated several times for every situation I have Jesus and then though the thoughts struck me I have Jesus but outside there there are lots of people who don't have Jesus and they're going through critical times they're going through difficult circumstances oh Lord our prayer as a church is that more and more people in our community will come to know the blessings of Jesus not only in the glory of his salvation but in also in the wonder of his day by day presence in many tough times of life oh Lord bless someone in mind for today we pray and speak to their hearts and show them something of your love through Jesus Christ we pray Amen. Amen. <coughs> yes, Father, we thank you that you've made a difference in our lives day by day. And we do want to praise you this morning. We thank you that um, we needn't be fearful. And when we are, we can trust you completely. And we thank you this morning as we come together as a group of people <coughs> that we can praise and worship you. We thank you for this wonderful privilege. We ask that you draw near to us now, that we will really be pleased that we've come together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for your presence this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship and praise you. Mm. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings all throughout this week. And thank you, Lord, for the answers to our prayers. Amen. 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 Well, we've been singing, for this we have Jesus. And we're so thankful that we do have him. Help us all to trust in him fully. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm. Lord, in him is true. And we're thankful for that. In him is life, life eternal. And we thank you for that wonderful well, act of grace. Mm. And we said, the Lord Jesus is our life for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Amen. 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 Let's continue in our worship. He lavishes grace as our burdens grow greater.
like to take your seats, and Ollie's going to lead us through our communion. Thank you, Ollie. Mm. So we're coming to a time of communion just in Ireland. Because the thing to be mindful of is, why are we doing this? Is it something that's magical? Does it change us? Or to me, it's an act we carry out to remember <clears throat> why we're here this morning, who we're here to worship and what he did for us. We uh, look back 2,000 years to the events of Calvary that we focus on at Easter. We focus on a man being led out to a city carrying a wooden cross and, and dying there. And for all extents and purposes, that wasn't an uncommon thing. It was just another man being led out by the Romans to be executed. But to us, it's far more than that. We believe this was the Son of God and is the Son of God. We believe that he wasn't being punished for any wrongdoing he had done. We believe he was being led out to take the punishment for the wrongdoing we have done. When we read through the Old Testament, through the law, all the requirements there, Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Everything he went through, every, every whip, every punch, every strike, getting removed from within the city, being put outside of the camp, ultimately dying, all of these things fulfilled some requirement of the law. Everything he went through. And as we read through and realize, in, in my past, I've told lies, I've done things, I'm guilty. Jesus again said, whoever's guilty of breaking one part of the law breaks the whole law. And as I read through the account of Calvary, I see Jesus being beaten, Jesus walking that route to Calvary and dying on the cross. And all of the punishment he was taking was the punishment I deserved. And that's the same for each and every one of us. So looking back at Calvary, we see the love of God being poured out for us, for giving us the opportunity for forgiveness, for being restored to our Father. And so what we have in communion is a reminder. We are playing a part, we are acting out, and we are demonstrating what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us in the breaking of the bread we're remembering his body was broken for us, taking the punishment we deserved. And in the drinking of the cup, we remember he poured out his life. It wasn't his life was taken from him, he willingly gave it up. We remember when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers were going around searching, and yes, he was betrayed by Judas, but the soldiers that came to arrest him asked him, are you Jesus? And he said, I am, and they fell back from him. They didn't overpower him and seize him. He gave himself up willingly. And that's one of the most incredible things to me for Calvary, that someone would willingly go through all of this. For me, someone who, you know, 2,000 years before I was even born, he went through that to take the punishment of the things I hadn't even done at that point. And so as we have this time of communion, it's a chance to reflect and be thankful and remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. And so we shall start by remembering the bread, the breaking of the bread, the body of Christ broken for us. And I just ask if someone could give thanks for the bread, then we shall break and distribute around. <coughs> Father, we thank you that Jesus is the bread of life. And as we break this bread, we are reminded of his broken body on the cross. That he bore our sins for each one of us. And we're thankful that if we come and confess our sins, he is faithful to give our sins. Lord, we thank you for that wonderful opportunity that you gave us. And you can continue to give 
people in this world in which we live. And if they put their trust in the Lord Jesus, they can have forgiveness of sins. So as we break the bread this morning, may we be thankful in our hearts for all that Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. Amen. We read in the, <clears throat> in the scriptures, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again we uh, come to the, the cup and reading from the scriptures again. In the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Reminder there that we look back but we also look forward. We look to the day that the Lord Jesus returns as well. We do not know when it will happen, but we should be living in the expectation that it could happen any day. But this act of remembrance will take place until he returns. And so as uh, was often said to me, this is one less time until his return that we shall have this time of communion. It's almost a countdown with an unknown number. But again, if, we, uh, if someone could give thanks for the, for the cup and uh, we will pass around. <coughs> Without the blood, there is no remission of sins. And God forbade his people to eat the blood, because in the blood there was life. And this blood, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, is life eternal. We thank you, Lord, that there is no other name given amongst men by which we might be saved. And as we take together of this wine, Lord, we remember the cost, the price that was paid, the blood that was spilt, that covered my sin. Amen. 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 Take the cup and we shall retain it all drink together.
Let us uh, drink together now in remembrance of our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. worship and before Ollie comes and shares from God's word, let's stand and sing, um, thank you for the cross Lord, thank you for the price you paid. of the day take over and before you know it you're right through the day and you haven't even found the time the moment to kind of just spend time in prayer with with our God and 
when you're in the midst of troubles and struggles and everything piling on you, in many ways that's a time when prayer should be our first, the first thing that we do, rather than something that gets buried under, under life. And I'm sure when we talk of prayer, there are many things that will come to mind. It is something we are encouraged and told to do, but I'm sure for many of us it can be a real struggle day to day. Paul, in his writings in the New Testament, encourages believers to pray without ceasing. That's not to say we should be praying non-stop at every single waking moment of the day and night. But rather it's a life built around prayer in all areas that we go through. And ceaseless prayer doesn't mean that we should pray only at certain times of day, following a ritual programme of coming to prayer at set hours. What it means is there is no moment during the day where we cannot come before the throne of grace, bringing our prayers to God. I'm reminded many years ago of a youth group I used to lead, and the youth fellowship there, the young people, they always talked about wanting to pray at the end, and that was great. But they'd spend so long talking about the things they wanted prayer for that they ran out of time to actually pray. Whether that was actually their strategy all along, who knows. But uh, hopefully as we consider prayer this morning, we'll see it's not just bringing a list of requests before God, but it's part of our day-to-day -day communi communication with the God who sent his son to die for us. It's evidence of a relationship with him. I think over the years there are many people who in the past were friends who now I couldn't tell you where they are, what they're doing. And a big part of that is communication. If we're not communicating, friendships and relationships start to just tail off and cease. So does the Bible tell us a correct way to pray? I think it, as in all things it's best to let the Bible speak for itself in these matters. But there's two main areas. There's the private prayer and then there's prayer publicly. We read in Matthew chapter 6, part of the Sermon of the Mount. But when you go, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Ultimately, prayer is a communication, it's a conversation between us and with God. It doesn't have to be part of a group. Yes, like this morning when we were sat around with our teas and coffees, we were more often than not in a group of people all talking together, but can have a lot of value just in a conversation, just one-on-one -on -one with someone, and prayer, just yourself and God, that's the most, the closest of conversations you can have. Many of the examples of prayer we find in scripture were from a lone person crying out to God from their time of trouble and isolation. And this privacy allows the believer to share things that they would not wish to necessarily share with others but which they really decide to be laid into the hands of God to help them with. Again, our example in this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He regularly went off alone to pray, usually before the sun rose. For example, in, Math in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we read, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And of course we read on, the disciples didn't realise this, and every time this happened they'd go off searching for him. Oh no, Jesus, where's he gone? Better go find him, maybe he's wandered off, maybe he's lost. But you'd think after a while they would have learned, no, this is his habit. He started the day in prayer, he went off alone before the sun rose, and spent time talking with his father. And of course we can pray to God at any point during the day, not just in the morning. Sometimes you may set aside a time for prayer. But sometimes there may be a sudden need to pray just because of a situation that's arisen. In the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, we find Nehemiah's come before the king with a request, and this in itself was a dangerous situation, because you don't just walk up to kings and request things. But when the king said to him, what do you request? We don't read that Nehemiah immediately went into his list of requests. We read, so I prayed to the God of heaven. His first response in this, where if he said the wrong thing, that was it, he could have been executed. So his first response was, okay God, I'm here, I've been given this situation, 
just be with me in this situation. We don't know the exact words, but I doubt it would have been a lengthy, several minute long prayer because you wouldn't want to keep the king waiting. And I think if you find there's something you feel need to pray about, don't wait for that time in the evening where you would normally pray. Pray for it there and then. <coughs> doesn't have to be a lengthy prayer, doesn't have to have fancy words. It's just, God, I'm aware of this situation, please intervene in it, and it's immediate. That's one of the great things about having a relationship with God. You can come before him any time of day directly. We don't need to go to someone else and wait for them to get to that point on their list of prayer <coughs> items. We can immediately come before the throne of God with our prayers. And of course, alongside private prayer, there are times when we pray together as well. And just as Christ set the example in going off on his own and praying, he also <coughs> would pray publicly. For example, in Matthew 15, 36, and he took seven loaves and fish and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude. He publicly prayed in front of all of them, thanking God for the provision of the food and the, for the miracle that then went on to happen. After, his, um, after the, the Last Supper and prior to his betrayal at Gethsemane, the Lord invited his disciples to join him in prayer. We also read of the early church. They met regularly and prayed together. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. These should be the core model of any church meeting together. We follow the teachings of the scriptures. We're in fellowship with one another. We have the breaking of bread and we pray together. These are the hallmarks of the church. And this is what has been recorded for 2,000 years of history is the model the church followed. And these examples don't involve every single person praying, but they do involve people praying in the presence of others. So we don't need to be public, but it can encourage others to know that others are praying for these situations that we're mindful of. There's a chance to pass on requests to others so they can pray for situations as well. Then when we come to the thought of, well, how do we pray? I'm sure we've been in churches where we hear someone pray and we think, oh, I could never pray like that. But that's, it's not about praying like someone else. Again, it's about having a conversation with our Father in heaven. And Jesus, again, when asked about, well, how should we pray? In Matthew chapter 6, he went through and explained to his disciples how they should pray. So we read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that it may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in a secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
And again, we have to take care that we don't allow this example of prayer to become something we just empty, meaningless, mindlessly repeat that he very much warned against. This is meant to be a model of prayer, an example to follow, but showing where our heart should be focused in our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Prayer should begin with a focus on the one we are praying to. If I'm having a conversation with Emily and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm having a conversation with my parents up in Scotland, that conversation is going to get very weird very quickly. Um, if I'm speaking to Emily, I'm focused and thinking, I'm talking to Emily. In the same way when we're praying to God, our focus should be on the one we are praying to, on God. I know myself, easy to mind start to wander very quickly of, Ooh, what, what do I have to do at work tomorrow? Um, what do I have to do here, there? What's next coming up on the, in the evenings? Mind starts to wander. But if we're focused on the one we are praying to, it helps guide our conversation and being mindful of the one to whom we are addressing and speaking to. We focus on his relationship to us, his power and his authority, on respect for him. And it is true he understands our intentions, but he is holy, he is powerful, he is great. The name of God is not one to just casually cast around. He is God, he is the <coughs> ultimate, he is the creator, he is everything. And I suppose it's humbling to know that we can come before him, because in the entirety of the history of the world, who are we to come before God? And yet he wants us and desires us to do this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It should be a realisation of what is the central desire of our lives, our focus, our desire should be to see the work of God's kingdom advance. Not on elevating ourselves and making ourselves great. Prayer should be God-centred and focusing on his will. What does God want to be done? Not... God, do these things that I want to be done. We read of Satan when he was cast out of heaven. He desired to be in the place of God. I will ascend to the throne of God. I will sit in his throne. I will, I will, I will. There's no room for I will in following God. It's what's God's will. And so our focus is on our Father, and what his work is, not our own desires, not building the Milton kingdom in Marchwood or, or anything like that. It's on seeing the kingdom of Christ, the word of Christ, the church of Christ grow. And it goes on, give us this day our daily bread. So at this point we come to asking about things that we need in life. It's not simply here talking about provision of food, but all the things we need to go about in his work in our lives. Of course, we can allow that to slip into things we want rather than things we need, but the focus should be on what we need for what we're going about doing. And it's not about long-term provision, it's about having the faith to ask for what we need for this day only. Christ encourages, late, encourages us later in this same chapter not to worry about tomorrow and what the troubles may come tomorrow, for there's enough today to think about. And so in our prayers, it's the immediate. Yes, there will be long-term things that we want to pray about, but it's the provision of God to see us through this day. And then the next day you start and you're praying, and Lord, give me, give me the strength to do your will this day, and this day, and this day. It's in the immediate. Then we read, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The subject of forgiveness that we've already focused on this morning in our time of communion. If we're saved, nothing can take that away. But we can still make mistakes. We still need to come before God and seek his forgiveness. Because when a relationship is strained, when there's something not right, it makes things hard. And so coming before our Lord and saying sorry for the things we have done that we know displease him is an important thing. 
equally important is forgiving others who have wronged us. It's easy to build up a list of wrongs, especially um, especially if you've got siblings. There have been many, may have been many things over the years that have happened that keep coming back to mind. But we should forgive others as the Lord has forgiven us. And if you consider everything he went through in forgiving us, then forgiving someone else something they've done to us can almost in many ways seem trivial. But if he has forgiven us and restored us to a right relationship, we should be people who forgive others and not hold on to wrongs that have been done. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Of course, it can sometimes be easy to overlook in the midst of all the kind of physical challenges around us that we are in a spiritual battle as well. Our enemy, the devil, tries to lead us astray with temptations. But our desire should be that God lead us to places where we will not be tempted. And should others wish us harm, we should seek that he might deliver us out of their hands. We should be following and allowing Christ to lead. <clears throat> You hear people say, oh, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and when they've got into trouble, but sometimes we, we have, in our own way, taken us to those places. And yes, it's the wrong place and we shouldn't be there, but <coughs> when we look back, we've only got ourselves to blame for getting, us, getting ourselves into the mess that we've got ourselves in. But we should be praying that God will help and give us a shove when we're just starting to wander off the wrong way. We were, I didn't read it in the passage on communion earlier that I'd shared from, but we are encouraged to examine ourselves. We read in the Psalms, David saying, you know, if there is anything wrong in me, show me and put me on the path of righteousness. That is part of this, that if we're wrong, we don't always necessarily realise, so we should be asking God to highlight and help us to get back onto the path that he has set before us. And we close the, the, uh, this example of prayer with, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Never lose sight of God through our times of prayer. <laughs> we start with, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We end with, your Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We shouldn't let our prayers become about ourselves, to try to elevate ourselves. They should be focused on, on God, on him and what he has done, what God is doing and what he will do. Our prayers should be built around these elements and whilst, yes, there will be times when we read the Lord's Prayer together, it's... Not that that should be the entirety of our prayer and we should only read those words and no other prayer will do. It's an example of prayer. That we're remembering who we're praying to, what we're praying for and why. And praying that in our own weakness, God might sustain us and help us and guide us. These are all key elements of, of our prayer life with God. And it doesn't matter whether it's a short prayer or a long prayer. It's remembering that he is God. Something else to remember is that while he is God, he is also interested in each and every one of us as an individual. Again, we read in the passage, he knows what we desire to pray for before we have even prayed it. But it pleases him for us to bring our prayers before him can be summed up in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But there are also times when we are so disturbed and troubled by things that are going on in our lives, whether it's heartbroken over things that have happened, or we just, everything is so chaotic we don't know where to even begin. God understands these times as well. Romans 8.26 tells us this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
I said earlier, prayer is in many ways a conversation between two people, but we also see in the scriptures that every part of the Trinity is involved in that prayer, in prayer. We are, yes, coming before God the Father on the throne, and that is an incredible privilege. But the Lord Jesus Christ is stood there interceding as well. The devil's there accusing, oh, don't listen to him, don't listen to his prayers, don't, don't answer him. He's, he's done this and this and this and this. And the Lord Jesus is there going, I know he's done these things, but I took the punishment for those things upon myself. And the Holy Spirit is, in, is connecting us to the Father. The whole of the Trinity is involved in prayer. We may not ever really think of it like that, but it's, it's true. And how does God speak back to us? Well, through the scriptures, through maybe some th message laid on the heart of someone else. Sometimes it's that knowing, just the, the Spirit speaking to us within, telling us what we should do. God knows our hearts. He knows that what we desire to pray for. And sometimes the words don't come out right. Sometimes they get muddled. But God knows what we're meaning. God knows what's on our heart. And it doesn't matter whether we're in a group or whether we're alone. We can be sure that he hears us. He'll also give us an answer in his own time. It may not be the answer that we want. It may not, we may not get the answer right away, but he will answer. Again, being involved in youth work in the past, you get young people who are convinced that when they read passages about anything you ask for in Jesus' name, God will give you, that they kind of twist that to, well, there's one kid who's like, I'm just waiting for the motorbike to arrive now. But it's praying in accordance with God's will. That yes, we can pray for all kinds of things that God's never going to give us because they're not something that is within his will for us to have. And sometimes, yes, his answer is yes, I will answer and I will give you what you're praying for. Sometimes, though, the answer is no, that's not what you need. You need something else. Sometimes it's an encouragement to be patient, to wait for <clears throat> God's timing. And sometimes God's answers to prayer are completely different and beyond what we could possibly have imagined. He knows our hearts as well. He knows a bit praying to show off like the, the people who are stood on the street corners proclaiming loud fancy words but without any actual knowledge of the one to whom they were praying. He knows that if we're putting on an act but we might fool others but we cannot fool God. We're to come before him sincerely, not deceitfully. And God will answer but we have to be willing to listen. It's all too easy just to talk and talk and talk and talk and then never listen <clears throat> for the answer. But it may come through, as I've said, through the scriptures, through a sermon, through the actions of others, change in circumstances, knowing the calm assurance that God has it in hand. But rushing on, assuming we know how God's going to answer, doesn't generally lead us to... Uh, the fulfilment in our prayer lives, we should trust and wait for God's answer in things. And there's a danger in assuming we know God's will as well, and so rushing on without bringing things in prayer. We read in the Old Testament when the people of Israel were conquering the land, they had <coughs> taken Jericho. And they were like, okay, there's another city. They didn't bother to approach God, pray to God, they just went and attacked that one and their attack failed and it was devastating because they assumed they knew God's will and just rushed on blindly. And I know myself, if, I, if I've ever done that, it never ends well. We should never assume to know the will of God and what might have been the right thing at one point in time isn't necessarily going to be the right thing in a different situation in the future. And in our busy lives, we should always remember prayer is an the most important way to begin the day. I know that's something I struggle with. I, I should find time to pray in the mornings, but more often than not, I get up and I'm immediately getting into the kind of just daily routines. <clears throat> but if we find we're too busy to pray, then there's clearly something wrong and we need to be deliberate and find time to, prayer, to pray. 
A day that's begun and ended in prayer is a day that begins and ends the right way. There's never a, prayer is never wrong. It's always the right thing to be doing. And when I think about prayer and how central it should be to the Christian life, our walk with Christ began with prayer. If we did not call out to the Father, then we have not come to the Father, we have not been saved, we have not accepted the gift of salvation. We begin by calling out to God. In, in the words of um, people like Peter when he was saying to Jesus, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, he recognized his own brokenness. And yet Jesus still said, follow me, and then Peter acted and followed, but it was a conversation. And then others have said, um, forgive me for I'm a sinful man, God forgives. But it always begins with an act of conversation, of talking. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. And we read that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but it's a calling, it's a conversation, it's not just an assumption. We talk to God, we ask him to forgive us, to come into our lives and to put us on the right path. And without that conversation, without that daily walk and interaction with God, we're just going around assuming we know what we should be doing in any given moment. And I think prayer is always going to be a challenge when we allow the distractions of life to take over and, and that's all too easy. Um, for many people, if they kind of are trying to end the day praying, more often than not, it's very easy to suddenly find, oh, I've fallen asleep. Um, you know, it's, there are things that take over, but it has to be deliberate. It doesn't just happen of its own accord. And again, how do we grow in a relationship? We talk that the church here in Marchwood is knowing Jesus better and making Jesus better known. How do we know Jesus better? Well, how do you get to know anyone better? How do you get to know the people sat in this room better? You talk to them and you listen to them and you interact. And we interact through reading the scriptures, through hearing from God's word, through singing songs of praise to him. But most importantly, it's through praying to him and listening and waiting for that answer that we get to know our Lord better. And that in itself helps us to make Jesus better known to those around. Because how can we tell someone about someone else if we don't know them that well? So by us knowing Jesus better, we can make him better known in a world that desperately needs to know him better.